Welcome to the Institute of Catholic Culture, a nonprofit Catholic organization dedicated to the re-evangelization of our society through educational and cultural programs offered to the public at no charge. This and other presentations, hundreds of hours of audio, are available for free on our website, www.instituteofcatholicculture.org. There you can listen to or download educational programs related to all aspects of our divine faith, and you can review our schedule of upcoming events. We hope you can join us in person. Blessed is our God at all times, both now and ever, and unto ages of ages. Amen. Almighty Master, the help and salvation of the world, the Redeemer and Savior of the sick, the physician and aid of the alien, the healer of sorrows of mankind's bodies and souls, who vanquished death, our God. We now beseech you, cleanse and rid us of every malady of body and soul. Lord, be not far from us. Send down upon us your heavenly power of healing. Cast far from us every lurking illness. Grant us aid in this time of pandemic and deliver us from evil, grief, and sorrow. End this present scourge and now grant us patience, O Lord. Uplift us and be the physician to all of us. Raise us from our bed of pain and from our bed of affliction. Accept the entreaties of doctors and nurses and all whose efforts serve and minister to the sick. They offer care and comfort. In your love for mankind, aid them by your power and strengthen them. To those who have succumbed to this accursed illness, and are now departed from us, grant them repose in a place of refreshment. They are your servants and our brothers and sisters. Restore us who hope in you to your holy church, healed and in health, to worship and glorify your holy name. For it is yours to show mercy and to save, O Christ our God. And to you we give glory, to the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, both now and ever, and unto ages of ages. Amen. So our speaker this evening is the president of Catholic Answers. He writes and lectures on the lives of Catholic heroes and villains and has addressed audiences across the United States and Europe. Christopher Czech served for seven years as a field artillery officer in the Marine Corps, after which he served for 19 years as the vice president of the Rockford Institute. In 2012, he joined Catholic Answers as their director of development and was named president in 2015. And in addition to all of this, uh, we are so happy to have Mr. Check as a dear friend of the Institute. He has lectured for us many times before. And welcome back, Mr. Check. Welcome. It's good to have you with us. I'm very glad to be with you, Father. Um, I, I, I have the highest esteem for the Institute. Uh, so I'm very grateful to all of you for your generosity to the Institute. And uh, you need to continue it. So God bless you, Father, and your, and your awesome team. And to all of you listening tonight, go online and make a big gift to the Institute for Catholic Culture, right? Thank you, Chris. I appreciate it. Good, good, good. Uh, let's start with a story. Around the year of our Lord 300, there was once from Cappadocia, a courageous cavalry officer serving in the Roman army, commanding 1,000 foot soldiers and 500 horse. His name was George, and he was a Christian. Now, it happened that he was riding alone in his travels in the land of Libya. And he came to a town called Silena on the coast of the Mediterranean, a few miles east of modern-day Tripoli. There lived outside of Selina, Selina, in a swamp, a large dragon whose venomous breath infected the people of the city with a horrible pestilence. To appease the dragon, they provided two sheep a day for his dinner. But when the sheep ran out, the dragon demanded a young maiden. By lot, each day, a maiden from the city was selected to be sacrificed to the dragon. And it happened that in time, the king's daughter was chosen. The king protested. But the people threatened to burn down his palace with his family inside of it. 
which you have ordered by decree for us to suffer, you and your daughter must suffer as well, they shouted, and gave him a week to mourn with his daughter and bid her farewell. He wept bitterly and said to his daughter, I will never see your wedding. I will never see the sons that you would bring forth to inherit my kingdom. At the end of the week, the princess dressed in her wedding gown, walked with calm to the city's edge to meet the dragon, sat down on a rock and began to cry. It was at this moment that George rode by on his steed, bearing his lance. Why do you weep, dear maiden? He asked her. Good sir, she answered, I see that you're a brave man, but you must flee or you will face certain death. I will go nowhere, he answered her, until I know the cause of your distress. The princess told him of the terrible dragon and her impending fate. And George answered her, in the name of Jesus Christ, son of the living God, I will protect you. Away, sweet knight, away with all speed, she begged him, but far from riding away, George couched his lance and charged the dragon at full tilt, dealing the beast a grievous wound, rendering him helpless. He called to the maiden, fear not, but put your sash around the dragon's neck and lead the monster through the streets of the town so that the people might know the power of Jesus Christ. This the princess did, but the people of the city fled to the hills for fear of the dragon. George called to them, accept baptism and become Christians, every one of you, and I shall slay the dragon. And on that day, the king and all his household and all the people of the city were baptized. George drew his sword and beheaded the dragon. It took four yoke of oxen to drag the beast to a field outside the town. The king offered George chests of silver and gold, but the knight ordered these riches distributed to the poor. He then charged the king to set an example of Christian piety for his people, to say the divine office every day, to assist at mass, to build churches, to care for priests, and to see to the needs of the poor. Returning to his service in the Roman Empire, George served in Palestine in the city of Lydda, where under emperors Diocletian and Maximian, a persecution of Christians so violent was underway that in one month, 17,000 had earned the crown of martyrdom. Many other Christians, fearing torture, had offered sacrifice to the pagan idols. Distressed in his heart by the apostasy of his Christian brethren, George took off his armor and put on the garb of a Christian. Standing in the public square, he shouted to the Roman officials, all of your gods are demons. My God alone, the God of the Christians, made heaven and earth. The prefect, whose name was Dacian, demanded to know who he was. My name is George, he said. I have fought in the service of Rome for the conquest of Palestine, but now I set all that aside to serve as a soldier for Christ. Dacian ordered George stretched on the rack and his flesh torn with hooks. His body was burned with torches. His torturers rubbed salt in the wounds, but George would not die. In the middle of the night, our Lord appeared to him in his cell and healed his wounds. The following day, a magician was summoned to kill George with wine laced with poison. George made the sign of the cross over the wine, drank it, and it had no effect. The magician declared himself a Christian and was beheaded. The prefect had George bound to a wheel fitted with knives, but this caused him no harm. He had him plunged in a tub of molten lead. Again, George made the sign of the cross and relaxed in the lead as if it were the most soothing bath. Will you not give up your superstitions? The prefect demanded of George. I will give you greater authority than you have ever had. George smiled at the prefect and said, take me to the temple of your gods. 
The prefect, thinking that George was going to relent, assembled all the people to see the Christian soldier deny Jesus Christ. Instead, George knelt and prayed to his heavenly father to destroy the pagan temple so thoroughly that all the people would know his power. With a great trembling of the earth, God reduced the temple to rubble. The earth opened and swallowed its idols and its priests. On seeing this destruction, the prefect's wife, whose name was Alexandra, scolded her husband for persecuting Christians and declared herself one. Her husband had her hung from a tree by her hair and beaten with scourges. She called out to George, good sir, light of truth, what will become of me for I have not been baptized. George exhorted her to be brave, assuring her, the shedding of your blood will be both your baptism and your crown. The following morning, George was to be beheaded, but first he knelt and asked God that all who had sought his intercession would have their prayers answered, and God assured him that they would, and he bowed his head to the executioner's sword. After the beheading, the prefect and his attendants were returning to the palace when fire rained down from heaven and consumed them all. Now, before we proceed, some disclosures. This lecture came about by the usual method. Father Hezekiah asked me to speak about a topic in which I have no expertise. I have learned by this point, however, that resistance is futile. Father is as persistent as Catherine of Siena in telling Gregory XI to get back to Rome. So I did ask Father if there were any themes he'd like me to stress. His response was, and I quote, I don't know, it'll be great, have fun with it. There you go. So tonight we're going to have fun. And here is one way, because we're all sick of looking at screens, and I know we're looking at a screen, there's no PowerPoint. So I'm gonna use this whiteboard, okay, in the Catholic Answers conference room. I suppose if Catholic Answers were really like super trad, we would have a chalkboard, but we're gonna have to deal with the, the whiteboard, all right? And the second way that we're gonna have fun is we're gonna tell some stories. And we're gonna see if there is a thing or two in each that is worthy of our reflection, all right? Now this account of the life of St. George is my own, reworked from the 13th century Legenda Aria, or Golden Legend. Though there are fragments that of the uh, life of St. George, fragments of accounts of the life of St. George, that go as far back as the fifth century, all right? They are every bit as fantastic as th this one, if not more so. Uh, there's one account where he's chopped into little bits and buried in different places, and then the parts of his body come back together, and he uh, is resurrected from the dead. But this one that I've given you, taken from the golden legend in the main, with, with my own embellishments, um, preserves the elements common to the story as it has been given to the faithful over many, many centuries. St. George is a number of soldier saints from the East, a devotion to whom flourished among Norman knights, Norman and Frankish, especially Norman during the crusading era. Although Western devotion to George does precede the crusades. So devotion to George in the West precedes the crusades. There are uh, shrines to St. George in England, the country of which he is today the patron, right? Um, there are shrines to St. George in England that precede the Norman invasion of England. Sharing center stage in this category of crusader patrons with St. George is another Eastern saint, St. Demetrius of Thessalonica, devotion to whom was widespread in the East and continues to this day, right? Uh, but not so much in the West until the crusading era, right? To round out our consideration of soldier saints, we're gonna talk about uh, two more from the West, Sebastian, right? Uh, and Martin of Tours, Martin de Tours, or as English would say, Martin of Tours, who unlike the other three, is not, strictly speaking, a martyr. 
and we will come to what I mean by that, all right? If we have time at the end of the evening, we'll talk about the 40 martyrs of Sebast, right back to the East. And my hope is that in looking at these stories of soldier saints, uh, we can find a few themes worthy of our reflection. And here's what I would like to suggest. Each of these soldiers might suggest to us uh, any one of a uh, number of truths. But this is how I've divided them up. Uh, the story of St. George and St. Demetrius is a good point of departure to talk about this modern obsession with the question, is it true? Okay? From Sebastian, we're going to get a renewed focus on the supernatural, right? And the fleetingness of this world and how our focus should be on the supernatural. From St. Martin of Tours, we're going to locate a moment in the history of the church when a new martyrology, a new style of martyrology has, is being written in an age when, strictly speaking, there are fewer and fewer martyrs, all right? And then with the 40 martyrs of Sebast, the reason why those of you with your Bibles can read ahead, the reason why we find these stories of soldiers so compelling. Now, the wonderful thing about covering so much ground in such a short amount of time is that totally relieves me of treating any of these themes with any serious depth, right? So I'm here tonight just to toss out a few suggestions. So St. George and St. Demetrius are the miraculous stories of the lives of saints true? Don't these fantastic stories make us Catholics look foolish to the world? My answer is yes to both, and that's good. The life of St. George that we started with comes from this book, The Golden Legend, or Legenda Aurea. A few words about The Golden Legend, written in the 13th century, right? By the way, side note here, or footnote, it's in the Legenda Aurea, that we first see the dragon account in the story of St. George, okay? So there are accounts of St. George going back to the fifth century, but it really is not until the 13th century that we first see that dragon account. And I mention this because it completely renders as false the charge uh, from uh, uh, unbelievers, un scholars, unbelievers, who say that the Christian church was just trying to uh, co-opt uh, some Greek mythology, like the Perseus and Andromeda uh, story. If that were true, we would see the dragon much earlier, right? Okay, a few things about the Golden Legend. It's great reading. And by the way, this edition um, from Princeton, Princeton University Press, has a wonderful introduction by Eamon Duffy, uh, a really first-rate scholar uh, and, and historian, uh, chiefly of the um, uh, so-called Reformation in uh, a Protestant Rebellion in England and Ireland. Uh, he has a great book. Well, you all know his book, Stripping the Altars, of course. Uh, he has an excellent other, a book called Fires of Faith uh, about Mary Tudor, which is a very fine revisionist history about a much maligned, um, though admittedly problematic, monarch. Anyway, it's great reading. It was written by a man named Blessed Jacobus Voragine, or that's the Latin in Italian, Giacomo de Verace, died at the very end of the 13th century, so 1298. It is among the most influential and most popular books of the Middle Ages. There are about a thousand surviving manuscripts, contemporary with Vragine, okay, in Latin. And then there are about another 500 in the vernacular languages of Europe, all right? It's extraordinary how popular this work was. And by the way, it remained very popular after the arrival of printing. So in the late 15th century, um, Duffy points out in the introduction here, from 1470 to 1500, the golden legend was more widely printed than the Bible, 
All right. Now, Jacobus was a Dominican. The golden legend dates to about 1260. So the Dominican order is not even half a century old. Okay, but who are the Dominicans? They're the order of preachers. What's their job? Their job, well, to preach, of course, but also to help parish priests get better at preaching. So really what we have here, my friends, is a collection of great anecdotes, stories to flesh out sermons. And we all know how, you know, a boring sermon can just be livened by a great story, right? So, uh, that's what he's doing. And it earned its name golden because everyone said it's worth its weight in gold. Okay, that's where that comes from. Now, interestingly enough, the word legend, very important, uh, or legenda, legenda aurea, legenda or legenda, I should say my Latin teacher is spinning in his grave. Actually, I think he's still alive. Legenda aurea, legenda simply means something to be read aloud, something to be read, especially aloud, from the Latin legere, all right? Okay, so, it, 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 so when we think about this question, is it true? It's important to know that the word legend, as we use it today, in other words, uh, a non-historical event or a mythical event, doesn't um, come into usage until centuries after the golden legend, okay? And it's because of this book that we have that usage. So as skepticism, as we enter into the Renaissance and into modernity, as skepticism, as skepticism replaces belief in the mind of the faithful, uh, then the word legend coming from this title of this book takes on the meaning that we use today. And this takes us to the question that I proposed. Are these stories of wonder in the lives of saints true? The answer is yes. Okay, so let's go on to St. Sebastian, right? No. So the answer is yes. But the question, in my mind, is an impertinent one, all right? It's not, it's not relevant. It misses the point. This is why it confuses fact with truth. It confuses fact with truth. So this is a question that you can take to the dinner table tonight or tomorrow night, sitting around the hearth with the family, turning off the television uh, as we all enjoy lockdown, right? What is the difference between fact and truth? What is the difference between fact and truth? So let me give you an example to set your conversation underway. I'm sure you'll be able to think of others. St. Thomas Aquinas in the Adorate Devote calls our Lord a pelican. Is this true? Is Jesus a pelican? Does St. Thomas Aquinas with the use of poetry get deeper into the mystery of the truth of our Lord's self-giving? Follow me? Might we look at the fantastic stories of the saints in the same way? Now, first of all, I say for the record, and I know this is being recorded, I declare my belief in the fact that George slew an actual dragon, okay? But for those of you who are struggling with the fantastic quality of this tale, I want you to consider this real insight from my friend Sean Fitzpatrick. Sean who teaches at Gregory the Great Academy outside of Scranton, Pennsylvania. One of the two best schools for boys in the whole world. The other one is St. Martin's Academy in uh, Fort Scott, Kansas. This is what Sean Fitzpatrick writes. Saintliness is, a, is, saintliness is fantastic. So its portrayal in fantasy is fitting. The truth of sanctity is in many ways more accessible through wild and wonderful tales that surpass the bounds of truth as we know it, or as we think we know it. For sanctity is of a higher truth. The stories of saints should offer a heightened element to the lives of saints, 
allowing them to appear clearly as citizens of two worlds, two worlds that they help bring together in Christ. The actions of legend render the invisible aspects of sainthood more visible. Hmm? Let's hear that again. The actions of legend render the invisible aspects of sainthood more visible, tangible, and attractive, giving the heroes of the church a dimension that goes beyond mere history, facts, beyond mere fact, and mere humanity. By exaggerating the extraordinary features of our holy ancestors, pious legends emphasize the very reason why they are saints. In other words, George slaying the dragon is not just true, it's more true. We struggle in an age afflicted, however, with a kind of crippling acedia, right? Sloth, uh, which doesn't so much mean laziness as much as, as much as it means just a lack of interest in higher things. This acedia, which by the way, I feel is probably being exacerbated by the current lockdown that we're all enduring, is in a special affliction of our age. We, we might even marvel to think, why would anybody be bored in this age when anything is available to him instantly, right? G.K. Chesterton, however, said, for all the utter falsehoods, the most false, I think, is the notion that men can be happy in movement when nothing but dullness drives them on from behind. In 1904, Pope St. Pius X noted that the Christians of late antiquity lived rude lives, destitute of all civilization, and yet they were eager for life and this no one could give them except Christ through the church. And truly, Pius writes, they had life and they had it abundantly. Today, on the contrary, Pope Pius X con uh, continues, although the world enjoys a light so full of Christian civilization, all the benefits of Christian civilization we enjoy, yet it seems as though it were tired of that life which has been and still is the chief and sole fount of so many blessings. So my friends, we have a spiritual fatigue. We have a spiritual fatigue. And the cost of this fatigue is grave. Pope Pius says, the cost of the spiritual fatigue is so much loss of eternal salvation among men. So let me translate, right? People are going to hell because of our spiritual fatigue. People are going to hell because of our spiritual fatigue. For all the supernatural, Pius continues, for all the supernatural order is denied. And as a consequence, the divine intervention in the order of creation and in the government of the world, right? Divine intervention in the government of the world and in the possibility of miracles. And when all these things are taken away, the foundations of the Christian religion are necessarily shaken. Men even go so far as to impugn the arguments for the existence of God. So I don't think we should take Pope Pius X's words lightly. He's explicit about the cost, uh, the cost of a loss of an awareness of the supernatural. And this awareness is fed by the stories of the saints. Again, so much loss of eternal salvation among men. Our loss of the sense of the supernatural, other people are being damned. When we dismiss the stories of the saints, it means we've lost our taste for, our longing for the supernatural. When we dismiss the stories of the saints, it means we've lost our longing for the supernatural. Folks, for my part, I would much rather live 
in a world where we share extraordinary stories about saints slaying dragons than one in which we doubt the divine, the miraculous, the very existence of God. Because that's the world that we're living in at this exact moment. And we can see it is a complete train wreck. All right, let's go to St. Sebastian to help re redirect our attention to the divine. Here's another story. Sebastian, a citizen of Milan, commanded a cohort in the personal retinue of Emperor Diocletian, altogether 480 men. He took advantage of his rank as a military officer to visit Christians who were being tortured to encourage them to be brave. It happened one day that two high-ranking Roman officials who were brothers named Marcellian and Marcus awaited execution because of their Christian faith. Their mother visited them in prison, begging them to change their minds. What misery is this that the youth of one's offspring is lost of his own accord? She cried. Next, their father appealed. The funeral arrangements I have made for myself, I will now carry out for my sons, he wailed. Then their wives and children admonished them. You are abandoning us. Who will look after us? What hard hearts you have. The young men began to weaken, but Sebastian was standing by, who was standing by, stepped forward and said, oh, you strong soldiers of Christ, do not let those tearful blandishments cause you to forsake the everlasting crown. Turning to the families, he said, your sons are not being separated from you. They are going to heaven to prepare starry dwellings for you. Since the world began, life has betrayed those who put their hope in it, has deceived their expectations, has fooled those who took its good for granted, and so it leaves nothing certain and proves itself false to all. The world induces the thief to steal, the angry to rage, the liar to deceive. It commands crimes, orders wickedness, counsels injustice. But this persecution we endure on earth flames up today and tomorrow blows away but the pain of eternity is ever renewed to stab more deeply. Therefore, let us stir up our desire, our love of martyrdom. As St. Sebastian spoke, he shone with a radiance for an hour that wrapped him in splendor like a shining cloak. And the families of the martyrs were all that day baptized and converted to the faith of Jesus Christ. The father, who was afflicted with gout, was cured when he was baptized. And a woman named Zoe, who had been mute for six years, was made to speak when Sebastian made the sign of the cross on her mouth. The prefect of Rome, a man named Chromatius, on hearing of the miraculous curse, sent, cures, sent for Sebastian asking to be baptized, for he too suffered from gout. But Sebastian first bade him to destroy all of his pagan idols. This he did, and yet he was not cured. Sebastian said, there must be yet idols you are hiding. And the man confessed to a secret room in his house in which a model of the whole order of the constellations allowed him to predict the future. The prefect's son was opposed to destroy so intricate a work. So he threatened Sebastian, I will prepare an oven and if, after we have destroyed the room and the model of the constellations, my father is not cured, then you will be roasted alive. When the constellations had been destroyed, the prefect was visited by an angel who told him that he had been cured. And on that day, the prefect, his son, and 1,400 other of his household were baptized. The prefect resigned his post, and the magistrates of the city renewed the persecutions. Many of the souls converted by Sebastian earned the crown of martyrdom. Now, when Diocletian, in whose household Sebastian served, learned of all the souls Sebastian was sending to Christ, he summoned him and said, I have always held you as first among my guard, but you have worked against me and against the gods of Rome. Sebastian told the emperor, I have prayed to Christ for your salvation and for the good of Rome. 
But Diocletian ordered him tied to a post and shot full of arrows. But the Lord revived him, and Sebastian returned to the palace steps to denounce the emperor. The Lord deigned to revive me so that I could rebuke you for the cruelties you are inflicting on the servants of Jesus Christ. Beaten with cudgels until he died, Sebastian's body was thrown in the sewer so that the Christians would not be able to venerate it. But he appeared to a Christian maiden named Lucina and told her where to find his body. She and her family buried Sebastian along the Appian Way where it rests today in the church that today stands there. Now, in this Sebastian story, we find a theme common among the stories of the martyrs. The things of this world cannot satisfy. They always disappoint. In the case of Sebastian, not only do the miraculous events of his life, the sick are made well, the dumb are made to speak, testify to the supernatural as having power over the world, but the exhortations of Sebastian also spell out the power of the supernatural over the world, the fleetingness of this life, on, of life on this side of the veil compared to the eternity of life on the other. This is not how the world sees things today by any means. We are constrained by an inordinate fear of death because we've lost belief in the eternal. It's also important to note, and the Sebastian story is a good example here, that scriptural warrants, miraculous healings, for example, are worked out in the day-to-day -day experience of the faithful. Why is this? It's because the prayers of the early Christians consisted in the main in almost entirely of the recitation of scripture. So it made sense to them that events of scripture would represent in their daily lives. These narratives of the miraculous continue even after the age of the martyrs had passed. It fell then to Christian storytellers to create a new martyrology for an age in which there were not martyrs in the strict sense of the word, right? Uh, beheaded, consumed by lions. The greatest example of this kind of martyrology is the dialogues of Gregory the Great, which I did a lecture for ICC. I don't know if it's on the website or not. If it's not on there, Father, then we need to do it again. Um, but uh, in any case, one of the earliest examples of this kind of new martyrology is our next soldier saint, Martin de Tour written by his friend, Sulpicius Severus. In other words, here is a martyrology about a man who, strictly speaking, was not a martyr. Now, unlike George and Sebastian, we can't account for Martin of Tours in a couple of pages, right? He is a central figure in the history of the West. He is, he is, the first century, among the earliest, probably the, the, the earliest, well, Hilary Poitier, he's among the very first uh, in the conversion of France. Certainly a central figure there. Uh, a great deal about Martin is known. So let's just quickly summarize. His father was an officer in the Roman army. Uh, his parents were pagans. He's probably from Hungary originally. Um, uh, it, 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 although his parents were pagans at the age of 10, he decides to become a catechumen. He followed his father. He follows his father as was the custom into military service. He's conscripted because he's the son of an officer. And then he eventually becomes an officer and he's stationed in Amiens. And it was by the gate in this great city that Martin, the most famous story that we know of, of Martin or the best known story uh, encounters the beggar practically naked on a bitter cold night in a, in a winter that uh, is described as especially, uh, especially severe. Uh, what does Martin do? He dismounts, 
and by the way, he sees other people ignoring the man. He dismounts, he cuts his own cloak in half with his sword, and he clothes the man in the other half. And the following night, he is favored with a vision of our Lord wearing that half of a cloak, right? And he is standing, our Lord is standing before the heavenly host in this vision, and he says, Martin, yet a catechumen, so not yet baptized, Martin, yet a catechumen, has clothed me with this robe. By the way, uh, this is where the word chapel comes from. You may or may not know this, but um, chapelle, uh, it's the very first place where the half of the cloak was venerated um, was in a little room that, uh, you know, cape, capella, little cape, right? So they just started referring to it as the capella where the little cape was. And then that's how the word chapel, that's the etymology of the word chapel. So it comes from St. Martin's cape, the room where the cape was kept, right? Room where a cape is kept, a capella, right? A little cape. Um, so now Martin, who's 20 years old after this vision of our Lord, hastens to be baptized. Well, who would, right? He remains reluctantly in military service until one day his commander is passing out the spoils of war and Martin refuses. And he says, give the spoils of war to the rest of these soldiers because I can no longer continue to fight because I am going to be a soldier of Christ. His commander accuses him of cowardice, but Martin says, I'm not a coward. And to demonstrate this, I will stand at the front line as we charge into battle tomorrow, unarmed, armed only with the protection of Jesus Christ, right? As it happens, he does not have to because the barbarians surrender the night before. He is released from military service and he goes to find Hilary of Poitiers who ordains him and he begins the life of a hermit and a preacher, converting pagans, suffering beatings by Arians, right? The Arian crisis is still underway here and will be for a century or more. Um, he founds monasteries. Uh, so why had his reputation for holiness spread among the people uh, that the people of Tours, right there, sent him, a, sent, him, sent him a message saying there's a sick man here who needs to be cured. And as soon as he got there, they took him uh, and they carted him away to the church and elected him bishop. A man of great humility, his rustic appearance uh, put off many ranking church officials, uh, but the much beloved Martin proceeded with a life of destroying pagan statues and temples, the famous hammer of St. Martin, which if, if you ever go to Utrecht, you can see it there, uh, raising the dead, curing the afflicted, casting out demons, squashing heresy, founding monasteries. There really is no understanding of the Gauls without understanding the life of St. Martin. But I'd like to take just one story from Sulpicius Severus and see what we might take from it. All right. So uh, this, you, you can find uh, Sulpicius online. They're really wonderful. And there's a nice little addition to that, uh, a book you can buy. They're, they're just delightful reading. Uh, this is chapter 13. Martin escapes from a falling pine tree. Again, when in a certain village he had demolished a very ancient temple and had set about cutting down a pine tree which stood close to the temple, the chief priest of that place and a crowd of other heathens began to oppose him. And these people, though under the influence of the Lord, had been quiet while the temple was being overthrown, could not patiently allow the tree to be cut down. Martin carefully instructed them that there was nothing sacred in the trunk of a tree and urged them rather to honor God whom he himself served. He added that there was a moral necessity why the tree should be cut down because it had been dedicated to a demon. Then one of them who was bolder than the other said, if you have any trust in thy God, whom do you say you were, whom you say you worship, we ourselves will cut down this tree and be it your part to receive it when falling. For if, as you declare, your Lord, your Lord is with you, 
you will escape all injury. Then Martin, courageously trusting in the Lord, promises, promised that he would do what he had been asked. Upon this, all the crowd of heathen agreed to the condition named, for they held the loss of their tree no small matter. If only they got the enemy of their religion buried beneath its fall. Accordingly, since the pine tree was hanging over in one direction, so there was no doubt which way it would fall on being cut, Martin, having been bound, is, in accordance with the decision of these pagans, placed in the spot where, as no one doubted, the tree was about to fall. They began, therefore, to cut down their own tree with great glee and joyfulness. While there was, at some distance, a great multitude of wondering spectators. And now the pine tree began to totter and to threaten its own ruin by falling. The monks at a distance grew pale. Uh, there were monks accompanying Martin. And terrified by the danger ever coming near, had lost hope and confidence, expecting only the death of Martin. But he, trusting the Lord, waited courageously. When now the falling pine had uttered its expiring crash, while it was now falling, while it was just rushing upon him, simply holding his hand up against it, he put in its way the sign of salvation. Then indeed, after the manner of a spinning top, one might have thought it driven back. It swept round to the opposite side to such a degree that it almost crushed the rustics who had taken their place there in what they deemed a safe spot. Then truly a shout being raised to heaven, the heathens were amazed by the miracle while the monks wept for joy and the name of Christ was in common extolled by all. The well-known result was that on, the day sal on that day salvation came to the region, for there was hardly one of that immense multitude of heathens who did not express a desire for the imposition of hands and abandoning his impious errors made a profound profession of faith in the Lord Jesus. Certainly before the times of Martin, very few, nay, Almost none in those regions had received the name of Christ, but through his virtues and examples, that name has prevailed to such an extent that now there is no place thereabouts where it is not filled either with very crowded churches or monasteries, for wherever he destroyed heathen temples, there he used immediately to build either churches or monasteries. So, Martin de Tour, Martin de Tour is the first non-martyr to receive the cult of sainthood. His hagiography by his friend, Sulpicius Severus, is one of, this, one of the earliest examples of this new martyrology style that I am talking about that we will see flourish through the Christian age. And this category, again, is a deliberate attempt or deliberate effort, I should say, to provide a martyrology in an age when martyrdom, strictly speaking, is starting to disappear. So in these stories, we see the same elements that we find in the martyr stories, fortitude, confidence in God, wonders worked, and especially an emphasis on humility, especially an emphasis on humility. As martyrdom becomes less widespread, the model for Christian life becomes men like Martin, who are what? Monastics. St. Augustine will later refer to them as the servi dei, the servants of God. And we see this expression in Gregory the Great, in his dialogues. It has a very specific meaning uh, about two centuries after Martin. Through prayer, fasting, self-denial, the monastics embrace a new self-imposed martyrdom. Again, because their prayers comprise almost entirely recitation of the scriptures, they fully expect scriptural warrants to be worked out in their day-to-day -day lives. So of St. Martin's age, of Gregory the Great's age, and as late as Blessed Jacobus Voragine, 
writing, Viragne, writing in the golden legend, we can say this. Scripture is not simply the historical record, the foundation of Christianity. It is the model of Christian life. The scriptures are both the source from which and the standards whereby one understands, one understood the mysterious structure of day-to-day -day life, including, but inextricably linked, bound up in the supernatural, right? Thus, the events in the Bible continue to happen again and again in the lives of the holy men and women who spend their days reciting scripture and struggling to live up to the model that it offers. So when we read in the life of Martin of Tours or in the Golden Legend about the cures for leprosy, restoring the sight to the blind, raising the dead, Martin raises, I think, more than one person from the dead. Certainly there's a guy who's been strangled, he raises from the dead. Um, we re, we, he, there's a man who wasn't baptized that he raises from the dead so he can be baptized. Uh, we read of spiritual realities that appear in scripture and they are repeated in the present. If such events are uncommon today, it's not an indictment of the veracity of the stories of the supernatural in the life of St. Martin or in the golden legend, as much as it is an indictment of our own age that long ago abandoned an intimate relationship with scripture. The working of miracles is evidence of a holy life, a life that locates its origin in virtue, especially humility, which is at the heart of this new martyrdom. The new Christian ideal is the monastic, he endures the assaults of the devil. He loves his enemies. He practices continued mortification. He resists carnal desires. And as Gregory the Great would later write, in their hearts, they sacrifice themselves to Almighty God and are thus martyrs in times of peace. And it is in Scripture, in fact, where we find the fundamental truth that helps us understand why these stories of the soldier saints are so compelling. So one more soldier saint story. And this one comes to us from St. Basil, the 40 martyrs of Sebast. 40 legionaries are serving on the Armenian frontier and they refuse an imperial edict to burn incense before idols of the ancient Roman gods. These men are Christians. The Augustus of the West is a young man named Constantine, and he has recently declared their religion legal, but his authority does not command the whole of the Roman Empire. His counterpart in the East, Licinius, is resentful of Constantine's growing power and of his growing enthusiasm for Christianity, and he has undertaken one last persecution. He is ignoring the lessons learned by emperors, governors, and prefects of Rome's past three centuries, persecution that has only increased the resolve and numbers of this troublesome sect. He is ignoring the words of Tertullian, penned a century before, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the faith. The 40 martyrs appear before the local magistrate, who first tries persuasion. He warns them of the disgrace that these soldiers are going to bring to their families if they refuse to offer sacrifice to the pagan gods. He promises them promotion, command, if any of them will. And yet, to the man, they are adamant. And no threat or bribe will induce them to forsake Jesus Christ. They are bound together with one long chain and locked in a small cell to wait, await their sentence. And during their imprisonment, one of their number, Melitios, writes a testament on behalf of his, of his brothers in arms. And each soldier is given his say. The young men, not long out of boyhood, salute their parents. One sends his prayers to his betrothed. Another 
to his wife and their firstborn, still an infant. In their testament, they exhort their fellow Christians to lay aside the passing things of this world and to fix their gaze and hearts on the glories of heaven. Knowing that they are to be martyred, they urge their fellow Christians not to quarrel over their relics. After weeks in jail, they are sentenced. They are to be stripped of their clothes, marched to the middle of a frozen lake, and exposed to the cold and wind of the Armenian winter until they are dead. Around the lake, the local governor has posted guards and set up fires and warm baths to tempt the martyrs to lapse. However, an insurmountable barrier stands between them and the shore, the unseen Christ whom they would have to betray to grasp the life that is leaving their bodies, breath by breath. The young soldiers pray together that none will fail in all 40 will will gain the crown of martyrdom. After hours and hours in the dark and bitter cold, the martyrs grow weak. The faith of one does falter. He crawls for the bank. Roman guards lift him and plunge him in the bath, but after enduring so many hours on the ice, the shock of the hot bath takes his life. One Roman guard, inspired by the faith of the remaining 39, declares in a loud voice that he himself is a Christian. He tears off his clothes and runs out onto the ice. The martyr's number is restored to 40. And they praise God with their dying voices. By the following morning, they are all dead, save the youngest, called Meliton. His mother rushes onto the ice to embrace her son, and he dies in his arms. My friend, here we see really the story, the note perfect, the quintessential story of the soldier, right? And it, and it is elevated, right, to the supernatural. It is elevated to the supernatural. And why? Because it is undergirded with this truth, right, from our Lord himself, right? John 15, 13, right? No greater love, right? Hath any man, greater love hath no man than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. Thank you very much. All right. That was a fantastic presentation, Mr. Check. Thank you so much. (laughs) It is always so inspiring to hear the lives of the saints. And uh, one thing too that I took away is is just to to be reminded of the power of the cross and the sign of the cross and how that, you know, making the sign of the cross um, just plays such a role in these stories that you shared with us. Um, We're actually getting a lot of questions about um, the source for the stories of St. Sebastian and St. Martin. Um, You held up a book there, The Golden Legend. Could you just speak a little bit more about that source? Sure, The Golden Legend or The Legenda Aurea. um, And you can get that in print. As I said, there's an excellent edition from Princeton University Press with an introduction by Eamon Duffy, who's a very fine historian, medievalist, um, an historian of the Protestant rebellion uh, in in England and um, and the Tudors, uh, he um, the the well as I as as I said in my remarks, it was a wildly it was it was a vastly popular um, manual for uh, preachers in the 12th century, written in the 12th century. Um, it would have been read by common men as well, but I, I, its its principal function was to provide uh, priests, parish priests, preachers with material for sermons, uh, examples of holy lives of men and women, um, and uh, and 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 so there there are there are other. There were other works like the Legenda Aria, the Golden Legend, before and after, but this is this is the this is this is the ultimate example. So when Jacobus de Voragine, who I think was B- 
Bishop of um, uh, Genoa. Um, he, and he was a Dominican. And like I say, he's working in 1260. The Dominicans are found in when? I don't know, 1216 or something. Somebody looked that up. Anyway, um, he, uh, uh, he, he is, um, he, he is filling, fulfilling the function of a Dominican as an order, as a member of the order of preachers to help other priests be good at preaching. Um, we tend to think of, of priests now as all kind of having, you know, some, um, fundamental instruction anyway in homiletics, or actually maybe we don't think of that, uh, but, um, or apologetics, uh, which they tend not to get in seminary. But, you know, seminary instruction, uh, as we understand it today, is um, it, uh, something of a function of the Renaissance and after. Uh, so people would have been ordained to the priesthood with a, with a, with a range of knowledge of scripture and theology. And so orders, especially like the Dominicans, and then eventually the Jesuits, they come much, much later, of course, um, are founded, you know, to, to be, uh, uh, well, guardians of theology. Of course, it's the Dominicans who eventually get involved in the various inquisitions, um, you know, to, to the defense of the faith. I think I may even have a talk on the ICC about the inquisitions. Um, but... Uh, but anyway, so he's fulfilling his role as a Dominican to give other priests, you know, fuel for their sermons. Um, but it was a it was a vastly vastly popular book, and and Duffy goes through some of this data in his. Uh, so there were others like it. Um, Virgine doesn't write it out of whole cloth. He's he's cobbling together just the way Gregory the Great had done at the end of the um, sixth century uh, in, in his dialogues. He's cobbling together stories that he'd heard. He's pe doubtless copying them, maybe even in some parts word for word from other, uh, we, from, from other uh, similar works. And, uh, and, and, but, but to provide a single you know, go-to source. And like I say, there, were, there, there are about a thousand Latin manuscripts contemporary or a little bit after uh, Jacobus, who was a blessed, by the way, Pius VII um, uh, beatified. Um, so he is, uh, uh, so, so, so that, that's the function. But I really recommend you get a copy of it. It's, they're, 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 they're thrilling reading. So, so, so he doesn't come up with the George story himself or the Sebastian story himself, he's compiling it from earlier accounts and putting it in one book. But get a copy of it and read. In fact, you can do this online. I mean, I hate telling people to read online, but there you go. Read the rather remarkable thing that happens on Christmas Day in the Golden Legend. All right, something to look forward to. <laughs> yes. Okay, let's have take this one from Angela. Angela's writing in, and she is um, kind of wrestling with this. So she says, sometimes it seems we ought to be scared to become martyrs, in that accounts of martyrdom seem to either inspire like total fearlessness or outright fear, saying how in the world could they have done that? So what should be our disposition as a faithful Catholic um, in our view of martyrdom? like not going to either extreme. Sure, well, we're, we're, we're admonished not necessarily to, to, to seek it out, um, but uh, it, it, the, the reason someone is able to endure uh, the, the, the sorts of martyrdoms, and, and by the way, these descriptions uh, don't, exaggerate actual, you know, really good accounts that we have, for example, in Eusebius and other places, even more contemporary ones. And you can read the martyrdom of Polycarp, for example, that's a contemporary account of a martyrdom. It, it's, and, and, I, and I, I know that I have on the ICC website um, a, a, a lecture that we did in Virginia uh, 
about February of last year, so maybe 13, 14 months ago. So, so watch that. But the reason someone's able to go to his death with, with this kind of serenity is because he's lived a life of preparation for it. I mean, that's the main thing to take from the life of the martyr. Sure, the stories are inspiring and courageous. They're an ideal to aspire to, right? But most of us are not gonna, now, I mean, Mexico in the 1930s, I don't know if my Cristero's talk is up there or not, but I mean, the, 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 the tortures that these men, uh, you know, read the martyrdom of Jose Sanchez del Rio, um, the soles of his feet being skinned and being made to walk across gravel and men hung from telegraph poles and things of this nature. And, um, so, uh, you know, that was a hundred years ago in, the, in, in, in this hemisphere, very close to us, very close to California. Uh, California's first wave of immigration happens as a consequence of that war, Mexican immigration. Um, but anyway, so it's not a, a Spanish civil war. Abs the accounts of the martyrdom in the Spanish Civil War are, are horrifying to read. So the, so the early church, these accounts are altogether believable. Um, but the fact is that someone is prepared to endure them, to be sure. He's, he's getting some grace. I mean, everything we do, we get grace, right? So that's the first thing, of course. But then the other is he lived a life of preparation for this sort of thing. Yeah. I don't think anybody who's been lukewarm about his faith is going to walk into the Col Colosseum I shouldn't say Colosseum because I don't think people were fed to the lions in the Colosseum. That's probably not true. Into the into the circus of Nero or whatever, and face down the lions. Unless you know, he's been praying the divine office every day. So that's the answer to your question. Pray the divine office every day, at least lauds and vespers. All right, wonderful advice, and I think we will conclude with that. We hope you enjoyed this presentation from the Institute of Catholic Culture. If you'd like to learn more about the mission of the Institute and how you may become a part of this important work, please visit our website at www.instituteofcatholicculture.org or call us at 540-635-7155. And may the glory of Christ Church be ever more manifest upon the earth. St. John the Evangelist, pray for us.